Let's pray. Oh, Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that we get to gather together as your people. I praise you that your son Jesus has done everything we need to belong to you and that you filled us with your spirit that we are equipped for every good thing that you have for us. Tonight, whatever has happened today, I pray that your word will get into us in such a way that we will want to take it to everybody else. Father, grow us, challenge us, inspire us, ignite us by the power of your word so that when we walk out, we will be changed and will never be the same again. And all the God's people said. Hey, I was just thinking, have you ever been in a situation where you got no idea what to do? Right, yeah, some... Something's gone wrong, it's a new situation, you're stuck and you have absolutely no idea of how to get out of it. You've got no plan of action, you have no clue. I remember when I was a little kid at school, around about grade two, so I was like a seven-year-old, one uh, afternoon as school finished, rather than going out to the bus lines like I should, Because our bus didn't come for ages and would stand there for half an hour doing nothing. I just decided by myself to wander back into my grade two classroom because there was a globe of the world on the teacher's desk and I wanted to check it out. I wasn't meant to be in there, but I was just in my own little world. And I accidentally knocked the globe off the teacher's desk. Now, the good news is it bounced a little bit. It did not break. But here's the problem. At the very moment that I bent down behind the teacher's desk to collect it, at that precise moment, my grade two teacher opened the door, looked in, saw that there was nobody there, closed the door, locked the door, and went home. My life flashed before me. (laughs) I'm thinking, I'm going to be in my grade two classroom for the rest of my life. Like I was in a new situation. I didn't know what to do. And I thought, I will yell out the window and attract attention. But we were about three stories up. There was nobody in the schoolyard on that side of the school. And I kept calling out the window, help me somebody. I'm trapped in the grade two classroom. But there was nobody there. Well, thank you for your sympathy. So after yelling and screaming for about half an hour, I worked out that nobody was going to rescue me. Now, I was a seven-year-old kid, right? I could think things through. I thought, well, tomorrow, somebody will come back. There will be school tomorrow. The teacher will open it. I thought, maybe a cleaner will open it. It will be okay. I just have to spend the night here. But there was one thing that I hadn't counted on. I had drunk rather large amounts of Coca-Cola that day. And as I'm there as my little little seven-year-old, I'm realizing, I'm realizing that it's just building up a little bit. And I'm thinking, I can hold on, I can hold on or not, I can do this. And I just, like I just had to go, but there was nowhere to go. And I thought, what do I do? Like I'm trapped in this situation. There is no way out. I don't know what to do. And I thought, I can't hold it in. I have to go. And then I had an idea. Our class had a goldfish. Man, that felt good. Like, seriously. You'll be pleased to know that a cleaner came in about half an hour later, found me, they called my parents. I got safely home. The next morning, all the little boys and girls are lined up outside. Our grade two teacher says, come on, boys and girls, let's go into class together. Let's go and look at Freddie the Gold. Oh, boys and girls. I've got some very sad news. And there's little Freddy. Like, you know. <laughs> the 
that was a scary moment. It was a new moment. I did not know what to do, and I think I sort of made a mess of it. And I don't know if you've noticed in your life, there's always going to be scary moments. There's always going to be new moments. You're always going to be challenged with something that you've never done before. But I want to say you have already succeeded. There was a time where you wore nappies to bed at night. There was a time, the first time your parents let you go without nappies for the night. Parents, was this a little bit messy? Was it a little bit difficult? Were there some problems? But you, that was really scary, but my, my suspicion is all of you have made that adjustment. You now don't need to wear those nappies every day because you have actually learned a new way. But uh, can I just say that was scary? Like seriously, but you've done it. Do you remember the little, 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 little first little bicycle you had with the trainer wheels on each side? You know, little wheels that stick out to make sure you can't fall over. At some point, you had to take those trainer wheels off. And your dad would run alongside for like for kilometers, you know, holding on and say, Daddy, Daddy, it's okay, I'm here. And you probably fell over and you probably scraped your knee. But you understand life is always about doing new things. You've got to believe that it's possible because if you never tackle the new things because you're scared of it, then your life never goes forward. You never achieve the, the potential that God has for you. Life is always about doing new things. Now, I work with young people. I work with teens and 20s, and they're the most beautiful people on the planet. But I'd just like to say hi to the teens and 20s. Um, but here's the saddest thing. Many young people have actually given up. They're not doing new things. They're not taking new adventures. They're not trying to be good or different. And maybe if things haven't worked out for you, I understand why you're giving up. Like you tried something and it didn't work. You had a new idea and everyone said you were stupid. You tried something and somebody just knocked you down. And some of you have been knocked down so many times, you don't even think it's worth getting up again. Like there's an exam you're studying for, but you've done so little study this year, you're thinking, no matter how much I study, I'm never going to pass that exam. I may as well give up. Maybe you started a job and, and you don't think you'll ever go anywhere with that job. Maybe if you're older, you started a business one day and the business didn't work out and you've given up trying new things. Maybe you don't want to have new ideas because people just laugh at you and put you down and you end up in a rut and you're going absolutely nowhere. Come on. Have you ever just given up on something? And I'm wondering whether you've ever felt like giving up on Jesus. Come on, you love Jesus, right? You belong to this church, but it doesn't always work out. You pray a prayer for something, you don't see the answer. You're desperate for God to intervene in a situation and you can't see his hand anywhere. You're not even quite sure if it's worth doing. Like, like you love church and you join in, but, but nothing's changing in your life. Nothing new is happening. You're going nowhere and you've just about given up. If you've ever felt like that, tonight God has something to say to you. I want to introduce you to a man in the Bible who had just about given up. He was a guy who was going nowhere. He didn't believe he would ever change and he'd given up trying. And one day he made a discovery which changed everything. And I'm just wondering tonight whether you will make that same discovery that changes everything for you. If you have your Bibles there, please open up at John's Gospel, chapter 5. John's Gospel, chapter 5. If you've got a Bible there, a paper Bible or an electronic Bible, as long as it doesn't make beeps and it's not as you not secretly playing Fruit Ninja or something, um, please open it up. Let me introduce you to this man, John chapter 5, verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda, 
with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. Have you got the picture? There's this great central pool, and there's all these sick people lying around it waiting to be healed. Now, have you ever heard the story that an angel would come down and stir up the waters, and the first one in would actually get healed? Have, have you ever heard that? It's not in your Bible. Come on, if you've got a Bible, look for verse 4. It's not there, unless you've got a really weird Bible. I'll tell you what verse 4 is, and I'll tell you why it's not in your Bible. Verse 4, which you, seriously, look this up. Verse 4 is missing. It says this, They waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool, after each such disturbance, would be cured of whatever disease they, disease they had. You've heard that? It's not in, seriously, it is not in your Bible. And I'll tell you what, somebody wrote it in at some point to try and explain about this pool. It was the local myth. People believed that it was true, but seriously, does that sound like God? Now think about this. There are sick people. There are disabled people. So God organizes a competition that the person that can push everybody out of the way the most, the one that can get in the water gets blessed and everyone else misses out. Does that sound like God? That the fittest, the fittest people would always get healed, the least sick would always get healed, and the worst ones off had no chance. Does that sound like God to you at all? And so when they discovered that one of the scribes had written that in, it was the myth that everybody believes, but it's not in the Bible because it ain't true. God does not heal like that. And if you're thinking it's like a little lottery as to whether God blesses you and you've got to elbow everybody else out of the way so that you can get the blessing from God, that is not the God of the Bible. But all these people believed it and this man had been there. Well, verse, verse 5. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time and he asked would you like to get well? Other translations show us this man was crippled. And maybe from birth that for 38 years, with no legs to support him, he had lain around this pool, hoping and believing that one day he would get in first and that one day he might be healed. And there in verse 6, Jesus asks what sounds like one of the dumbest questions ever. Look at it, end of verse 6. Remember, he's been there for 38 years because he wants to get well. So Jesus asked him, oh, would you like to get well? Seriously, what sort of a question is that? Why would Jesus ask that of this man that's been there crippled for 38 years? And I'll tell you why. Because often people don't really want Jesus' healing. They're so comfortable sitting back and complaining, they don't want their problem fixed. They don't think God can do it. They've given up trying and they don't even want his help. And people say, well, it's, 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 it's never worked before. Like I can't do anything. I'm not good enough for God to use me. I don't have enough money. I didn't have the right upbringing. Things will never change. What's the point in trying? And if you've ever felt you're saying those things, I understand it. But Jesus has something to teach this man who has given up trying. Jesus simply says, would you like to get well? All he had to say was, yes. Yes, Lord, I would love to get well. Would you like to check out what he actually says? Verse 7. I can't, sir, the sick man said. If I got nobody to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Somebody always gets there ahead of me. Can you see how he's given up? He uses the two classic excuses as for why people don't want Jesus. Number one, he's saying, it's not my fault. If I could get in, I would. And he's saying, well, I don't know in because there's nobody to help me. If I had somebody to help me, maybe I would get in. It's not my fault. And somebody else always gets in before me. It's their fault. 
They're the ones pushing me out of the way. They get the blessing and I miss out. Can you see right now? He's not just crippled on the outside. He is crippled on the inside. Now, I don't know what doesn't work in your life. I know there's things that you struggle with. There are things that are difficult for you. There is stuff going on that you're not even sure there is an answer to. And the temptation is to say, well, it's not my fault. Maybe if my parents had brought me up differently. Maybe if our family had more money. Maybe if we had a bigger house. Maybe if I went to a better school. Maybe if somebody helped me and we just blame everybody else for what's going on. Oh, if the government would just do more. If my friends didn't give me a hard time. If the police would actually show up when we call them. Now you need to know, as long as you're blaming somebody else, you will never be free of it. At some stage, you've got to take responsibility for saying, under God's power, I am going to do something. There is a hope, there is a future, and God will do it through me. So his first excuse is, it's not my fault. His second excuse is somebody else always gets in there before me. Come on, you've experienced this. Somebody else always gets the blessing. Now, you've heard stories about, like you're looking for a job and somebody else announces, oh, God gave me the dream job and it's just fantastic. Oh, praise Jesus. And you're sitting there saying, how come I didn't get it? You see people being healed and you're not being healed and you're thinking, how come, how come God picks them? But you're struggling for money. You're not quite sure how to make ends meet and somebody else suddenly comes into money and everybody is rejoicing, but you're thinking, how come I didn't get that? Come on, it's tough when somebody else gets the blessing. And this man is saying exactly the same thing. He wasn't now just lying down on the outside. He is lying down on the inside. He wasn't just crippled on the outside. He is now crippled on the inside. He is not just defeated on the outside. Now he is defeated on the inside. And Jesus' question to him is, do you want to get better or have you given up? Now maybe tonight you're feeling a bit defeated on the inside. And I want to suggest Jesus tonight is asking you the very same question. Do you want to be healed or have you given up? And I want to say that Jesus now takes charge and he tells the man to do three things which are absolutely impossible for him to do. Verse 8. Jesus told him, Now, remember, he's a crippled man for 38 years. Number one, stand up. Oops, that's impossible. Number two, pick up your mat. Oops, that's impossible. Number three, walk. Impossible. Now, just we're going to have a look at that. But just before we do, I want you to observe what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, oh, listen, 38 years, well, buddy, Just keep trying, like perseverance, right? Never give up. You've got to have a positive attitude. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Come on, we're cheering for you. Yes, up on your elbows, you little cripple. Come on. He didn't give him a motivational talk. He didn't even say, I will help drag you to the pool. He didn't say that. And he certainly didn't say 38 years Oh my goodness, let me make you more comfortable in your distress. Quick, a few little pillows here. You can prop yourself up. This is a pillow that you can lie on. I want you to be more comfortable as you lie in distress there. Oh, you need a little bit of cheering up. Perhaps we can tell you some jokes. Where's Trevor Noah? (laughs) Jesus doesn't do anything like that. Jesus is not there to make you more comfortable. He's here to make you more committed. Jesus is not just here to help you. Jesus is here to heal you. 
Jesus is not here just to bring you consolation. Jesus is here to bring you transformation. Come on. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make bad people good. Jesus died on the cross to make dead people alive. And that's the transforming power that he wants to work in you every single day of the year. Jesus tells this man to do three impossible things. And tonight I want to suggest he's telling you to do the same three impossible things. Number one, what does he say in verse 8? He says, stand up. Do you reckon that you could all shout that out? When I say number one, you could all yell out, stand up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to those six people. Okay. So he says to the man, number one, stand up. Woo. Jesus tells him to do something which is impossible. Now, there might be something that you're trying to change. Maybe you're following Jesus. It's just not working. Maybe you're struggling. There's a sin that you're trying to give up. Maybe you keep getting back into fights. Maybe you always get into arguments. Maybe you're getting a bit too much drunk. Maybe there's some websites that you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe there's some bad friends. And Jesus is calling on you to change. And it feels like it's impossible. But here's the good news with God, all things are possible. Come on, with God, all things are possible. And if Jesus is calling on you to do something, he will give you the power that you can actually do it. Whatever is holding you down right now, Jesus is saying, stand up. The second thing he says is pick up. So do you reckon you could do number one and number two? Number one is stand up. Number two is pick up, as in pick up your mat. Jesus says to the man, number one, number two. Now, why does he want him to pick up his mat? Were there anti-littering laws that he shouldn't leave it around? Is it like when you go to the airport? Unattended mat next to the pool. Security. Security to pool number six. Um, Why does he have to pick it up? Because if he had left it by the pool, he is removing all possibility that he will go back to it. That maybe he tries this walking thing and it's pretty much hard work. He's taking the mat away so that he cannot return to it. Pick up your mat means there is no turning back. So don't leave something around for you to turn back to. If you decided to go on a diet to lose weight and have that trim, taut, terrific body. And there's one piece of chocolate Bavarian double whipped cream pie in the fridge. And you say, I'm going on the diet. I'll just leave the pie in the fridge. It would be a shame to waste it. What are the odds you're going to go back to it? You understand he's saying, pick up your mat and get rid of it. There is no turning back. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes when we give up a sin, we actually leave the temptation around just in case we want to go back to it. We don't pick it up and get rid of it. We leave it there in case we need it. Come on, if Jesus is calling on you right now to make a change, I want to say there is no turning back. No going back to the wrong friends that were dragging you down. No going back to just being religious. Jesus is saying that mat used to control you, and now I want you to control your mat. You had to go wherever that mat took you. You were controlled by your mat, but now in my power, you were going to pick up that mat. You're in control. In control. And Jesus was probably saying to you, your circumstances used to control you, but now I want you to control your circumstances. Your addictions used to control you, but now I want you to control your addictions. Your sin used to control you, now I want you to control your sin. Your neighborhood used to control you, now I want you to control your neighborhood. And what are you letting control you? Jesus says, by my power, I want you to control it. Number three, he says, walk up. So number one is stand up. Number two is pick up. Number three is walk up. 
Okay. Number one. Number two. Number three. Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. When Jesus does something, he expects you to keep going. He doesn't expect you to stop there and say, oh my goodness, I can walk. I'll just stand around the pool now for the next 38 years. No, he wants you to keep going. He wants you. He's saying to the crippled man, don't expect to be carried. People have been carrying you around for 38 years and maybe you got used to it. Maybe it was easy street. You got to sit back and poor all your four friends had to carry you everywhere. And you kind of like that and it's comfortable and it's easy. Jesus is saying, stand up, pick up, walk up because when Jesus brings change in you, he now wants to bring change through you. He wants you to walk to others. He wants you to go and tell you them about him. Because if Jesus gives you the power to stand up, he will also give you the power. He'll also give you the power to pick up and walk up. That sick man by the pool had a choice. He could believe what Jesus said and do it. Or he could not believe what Jesus said and not do it. The next verse tells you, verse 9. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Now, wouldn't it be crazy if Jesus had actually healed him and the man didn't believe it? Jesus says, you're healed. You can come stand up. And he says, oh, I might fall. I've been here for the last 38 years. Imagine if Jesus healed him, actually healed him, but that man didn't believe it. And imagine if he stayed on his mat for another 38 years, complaining, there's nobody here who ever helps me. Do you understand that? Actually healed, refusing to believe it, and staying like a cripple on his mat. I'm wondering if it's possible if the Jesus has already given you the power to make a change in your life, but you don't really trust him and you're still sitting back on your mat. Come on, if you want Jesus to change your life, you've got to be willing to do what he says. All of us are crippled on the inside. All of us have things that hold us down You've got things that drag you back from being the person that you want to be. There are things that you're letting stop you from being the person that Jesus wants you to be. And sometimes, rather than dealing with it, you just settle for a mat. You just settle for being comfortable. You just settle for whatever gets you by, something that will make your life bearable, something that will make your life comfortable. There might be a pill or a drug that just makes it bearable. There might be the bottom of a bottle which gets you through. There might be your own achievements, your own success, your own applause, just something that makes you get through. Jesus is saying to you tonight, what is holding you down? What is keeping you back? What is stopping you from going forward? There's three things that Jesus is saying to you tonight. Number one, he's saying to you, stand up. He is calling on you to do something that seems impossible. Jesus is calling you to stand up for your faith. He's calling you to stand up for your family. He's calling you to stand up at school. He's calling you to stand up for your community. He's calling you to stand up for what is right. He's calling you to stand up against crime. He's calling on you to stand up to protect women. He's trying to, he's getting you to stand up for your future. He's asking you to stand up for Jesus. Number one, he says, stand up. Number two, he says, pick up. When you go forward with Jesus, there is no turning back. What you have walked away from, don't go back to it just in case you need it. If drinking is a problem, tip it out. Don't leave it there. 
If websites are a problem, get rid of the bookmarks. Put a filter on. Have an accountability part. Of it. Come on, you can do it. Whatever it is, Jesus is saying, pick up and don't go back to it. Come on, what in your life have you let control you where Jesus is now saying, by the power of my spirit, I want you to control it. Stand up, pick up, walk up. Have you started with Jesus? Great. Keep going. There's more. There's stuff at church you could do. There's groups you can join. There's courses you can go to. There's ways you can get into your Bible. You keep on going and Jesus is saying to you, go and make a difference because there's something new I want you to achieve. There's someone's life out there that I want you to change. The question Jesus is asking you tonight, do you want to be healed? What change do you need to make today? so that you can walk with Jesus and never turn back. Because if Jesus is calling on you to make a change, He's also giving you the Spirit to have the power to make that change. Tonight, will you just sit back on your mat? Or will you take the step that Jesus is calling you to?